Okay, and I'd now like to invite our moderator for the session, Stefan Delavo, President of the Caribbean Blockchain Alliance, one of our partners for the Island Finance Forum 2021, to come onto the stage and introduce himself and the panel. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, James. Hello, everyone. Good night, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you so much for joining us for this. Um, <laughs> This is funny. We were actually just, I was actually just talking with the panelists. Uh, we were talking about blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And obviously this panel is specifically based on blockchain and what it means for our islands, uh, our, our various regions, um, our, our countries and systems that are still trying to catch up in a lot of ways in terms of technology. And we said that interestingly enough, when people hear blockchain, they either don't want, don't care, or don't want anything to do with it, or they're a little overly excited about it without fully understanding it. So th this will be, this will, I think this will be great to properly kind of stabilize that conversation just to make sure that people understand what it is in the first place. Because uh, let's say a lot of people don't, um, but everyone on this panel is is obviously very excited about it. Um, so a little bit about, uh, sorry about me. My name is Stefan Delavo. I'm the president of the Caribbean Blockchain Alliance. We are an NGO uh, fully focused on education and public policy and the adoption of blockchain in the Caribbean region. But I won't take up too much of your time because these panelists are amazing and I want you to hear from them. So I'll kind of give you a quick bio for, for each. So first we have Sharman Powell, who's the chief risk officer of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. Then we have Sandra Guantenge Hart, who's the Blockchain Innovations and Cash Transfer Lead of Oxfam. Then we have George C.O.C. Samuels, who's the Managing Director of Firebrand Limited. Then we have Simon Chantry, who's the Co-Founder and Chief Information Officer of BIT. So what we're gonna do is talk about these kind of more practical aspects of blockchain and crypto that, that can really be put into play for us as a either uh, Caribbean or Eastern Pacific, but for specifically for island regions such as uh, central bank digital currencies, which we've already seen in the Caribbean with the sand dollar in the Bahamas and the Dcash in the OECS. And the interesting thing about that is that, and I know Sam will talk some more about that, is that um, both the Bahamas and obviously the Eastern Caribbean states, they are uh, archipelago, they're archipelagic uh, island structures, which means that they have multiple islands where people live, meaning that, you know, anything regarding payments, trade, or what have you is a bit more fragmented. And also there are, there are some islands where the banking, well, there's little or no access to banking. Um, they, they have things like supply chain that can be used with blockchain, uh, renewable energy even that can have blockchain as a layer above it. So without further ado, I will invite Sharman to start us off. Hi, thank, thank you, you, Stefan. Thank you, Stefan. And hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. And I'm pleased to be here this evening to, to, to share with you on the ECCB Dcash um, pilot project, which is a blockchain-based digital version of our EC currency. And that was launched on March 31st, 2021. We had a public launch of the Dcash in four of our eight island territories, being Antigua, Barbuda, Grenada, St. Lucia, and St. Kitts and Nevis. So this is what this is one of the practical applications of blockchain that we've used because we've used blockchain as the underlying infrastructure for our digital currency or central bank digital currency. And just to give a brief insight as to what were the objectives behind um, actually launching a central bank digital currency. So one of the objectives was um, payment system efficiency. In our in our consultations and our exchanges around the, around the islands, one of the challenges we recognized was there were fragmentations in the payment system, and there were some challenges and frictions in the payment system that made payments very inefficient. And so we sought to have a solution that would um, reduce these frictions and make it easier for persons to transact in the, within the countries and also across the ECCO countries. So that was one of our major objectives in terms of launching the Dcash. Um, having a solution that can ease the friction that persons are experiencing in making payments within their country and even across country. 
Secondly, we look at inclusion by digital enablement. And so what we recognize is that there are some persons who are financially excluded. They don't have banking accounts, they can't all the services. And so we wanted to ensure that we provide an opportunity whereby all our citizens across the ECCU can have access to banking services, but not necessarily in a traditional sense, but in a digitized way, so that they can have digital enablement while getting access to these different services that are available. And so the, the DCash system, um, through its, um, its design, helps persons across at all levels in the ECU to have access to um, a digital platform where, whereby they can make payments and enjoy the financial services that are currently being offered by the financial institutions. And thirdly, it's prom promoting innovation and competitiveness. Because if you have a, a, a platform, such as Dcash platform, which is blockchain based, that can now spur other forms of innovation. Persons can use this now as a, as a um, to leapfrog into other innovations, and that can improve competitiveness across the region and ultimately lead to economic growth and development. So these are well, the major imperatives that we looked at in terms of designing the Dcash system. Now, why blockchain? Why did we use blockchain as the underlying infrastructure for the Dcash? And there were a number of reasons that we thought, we thought about in coming up with um, which infrastructure to use. Firstly, data privacy. One of the key um, concerns that persons have when dealing with um, digital payments is the whole issue of data privacy. And that is based on the fact that you know, there's a lot of talk about um, cybersecurity incidents, hacking, et cetera. And so persons are concerned that their information is safe, their, their data, their, their financial information is safe. And we do know that um, in blockchain, uh, because of the end-to-end -end encryption, that there is in fact um, that data privacy that persons seek to have when they're effecting payments. Of course, network security is, a, is another um, key um, consideration for our, our infrastructure. And even though the blockchain technology is relatively new, it is sufficiently robust that they can, we can give that assurance that there is that network security, that persons can be assured that their transactions are safe, their trans transactions are secure, and that they are able to get the, um, the necessary comfort knowing that when they're transacting in Dcash, the underlying infrastructure is sufficiently safe to facilitate that. Um, availability was another consideration we had. And similarly to this, the security, the, um, the robustness of the, of the blockchain network um, ensures that there is availability um, for, for a solution such as Dcash, where it's actually payments, um, we expect it to be up 24 seven. So we want, want to make sure we have a system that is reliable, that can be, um, that can serve other persons of the ECU at all times. And there's availability 24 seven. And so the blockchain technology actually enables that. Ease of use. So one of the, the, the key considerations in the design of the Dcash was ease of use. Because because we are we're catering for all members across the ECC, we wanted to make sure that we had an application that the, the, the persons who are least financially literate can use. And based on our experience to date, both during our testing phase and since the public launch, we have gotten feedback that the, that the application, the apps are very easy to use, they're very user-friendly, and therefore persons are encouraged to be part of the Dcash experience because of the fact that there's ease of use. Notwithstanding they may not have any, any, any um, knowledge about blockchains, about um, any, any kind of, um, they may not be financially literate, the system is sufficiently simple that persons find it easy to use and are encouraged to use it. And of course, and most importantly, up into operability, because we, we know that the Dcash is not going to operate on its own um, post pilot. We expect that there'll be integration into other systems. However, we had to ensure that whatever the underlying infrastructure was, it is such that it can be interoperable that others, others um, other third party providers can tap into the, into the Dcash network and use it to provide other services to, to the region. And so those are some of the considerations that we had in mind, why we chose the blockchain um, infrastructure to underpin our Dcash solution. Now, in terms of um, how can the Dcash um, and this blockchain technology aid sustainable development for our countries? So firstly, it facilitates financial inclusion. And if you have persons financially included across the spectrum, across the ECCU, then you have, um, it, it makes for a wider um, marketplace, it makes for more innovation, and then you have all the persons being able to be part of that digital transformation that we're trying to see in the region. So by, doing, by using the Dcash, whereas some persons are currently excluded from financial services with the Dcash, because we have it a system whereby everybody can be included, then that helps to, to move us or to push us forward in the whole digital transformation sphere. As mentioned before, it reduces frictions in the payment system and promotes payment system efficiency. And 
if you're gonna if you're gonna move forward in our development process, there has to be ease of use. The, the, the payment system has to be sufficiently efficient that persons the ease of that it is the ease of doing business. And so, therefore, by by introducing Dcash, we are now addressing the frictions that currently exist in the payment system, improving efficiency, and thereby it is more encouraging now to do business within the ECCU using this method of payment. It also enables financial management and and business intelligence through data. So we know that through the blockchain, um, from the Dcash, persons can get a lot more data than they currently have even with um, other financial services or even using physical cash. So we are, we are expecting that with its increased data availability from the Dcash network, that persons now will be able to use that information to have greater financial management on a personal level, but even at a, at a business level, businesses can now use this data to improve their, their financial management for their business and even um, improve their, the entire business, their business um, outlook, because they can now have data which you can use to influence other decisions. So this is a key um, aspect and it is enabled through the blockchain technology as well, where you can have a vast amount of information which you can manipulate to get um, the results that you need to make business decisions. And finally, it promotes economic growth to in increase resilience and competition. So uh, we know that even using physical cash, there are limitations to the use of physical cash when it comes to resilience. So, um, when you have um, natural disasters, for example, currently we have a natural disaster in St. Vincent, and we are now pushing to rule out Dcash in St. Vincent in the second half of the pilot to be able to assist persons, because in that way, persons can get transfers easily from other parts of the region that can assist them in terms of um, mitigating some of the circumstances that they have. So generally speaking, we see the blockchain as um, being critical to the success of the Dcash and enabled us to get to that um, new level in terms of digital transformation that we want to see for the region. Thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you, Sean, and thank you so much for that. Um, we'll go straight to Sandra. Let's see, I think my video is off. There we go. Okay, hi everyone, Sandra Wantege Hart, uh, coming to you from Vanuatu in the Pacific Islands. Uh, my background is very different. Uh, I come from a background of anthropology and humanitarian assistance. So specifically natural disaster response, emergency management, um, and over you know the decade or so of my career, the majority of that has been in the islands, Southeast Asia, Caribbean, and currently based in the Pacific. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the Unblocked Cash Project, which is an innovations initiative to expedite the delivery of humanitarian payments in the Pacific region and beyond uh, at this point. Um, and it has two parts. So at its core, it is a blockchain powered payments platform run by Sempo, who's a tech partner to Oxfam, uh, that functions through crypto or token collateralized card based payments that are then redeemable at a network of local, small, medium, large, and even informal vendors across the islands who hold smartphones. It's a tap and pay system. Um, so as Sharman was saying, it has been specifically adapted for people who are not very digitally or financially literate. They simply tap their card against the vendor's phone in order to complete payment and pay for what they need after a disaster when they need it. In other words, the card functions like an electronic voucher and debit card um, loaded with assistance issued by an NGO like Oxfam or the government. And the phone functions as a point of sale device that allows vendors to track what they're making through the program, um, but notably to accept payment and help the markets around affected communities recover. So in terms of aid transparency, it's also a huge help because all payments are fully traceable by category of spending, age, gender, location, very important in places like Vanuatu, which is over 80 islands uh, and elsewhere across the islands. Um, and we can also track by things like category of vulnerability and timeframe. The second component of unblocked cash is a model and a method. So the technology is housed by this method, which is basically a programmatic approach that leverages the power and the structure of something that's very common across all the islands and all the regions where we have island nations. 
So this is the solidarity and the, the connectedness of community networks the expansive and decentralized nature of the islands and the businesses, particularly small and informal businesses that are on those islands and allows those businesses to actively participate in the process of disaster recovery. Um, and they're doing that by directly serving the communities they work with. So for those of us who live in these communities, we know that you know, the kiosk down the road might be your sister's brother's uncle's kiosk, for example. Um, so really looking at those social connections as, um, as a means of facilitating the adoption of this system. The whole approach, so both the building of the technology as well as the adoption by the community was conceived, piloted, and brought to scale here in Vanuatu on the ground. Uh, it was a fully participatory process. The first phase pilot was in 2019 serving around 1200 people. And we started with a bare bones version and built it up and enhanced its features and components based directly on community feedback. So that's where you know, we start to talk about blockchain from the bottom up and building applications that mimic people's behavior in different contexts, as opposed to building the application first and trying to airdrop it into different and usually culturally diverse contexts. Um, so we got here by kind of a trend in the humanitarian community, which is trying to deliver more and more assistance in the form of cash, which sounds good in the island context, because as we all know, if you're delivering bags of rice, rice and beans, tin fish across the islands, then the logistics of that is costly and it's very, very slow. So people don't get help when they need it. And usually the first responders are the communities themselves. However, in bringing Bringing this approach to the Pacific Islands, which was my job when I joined Oxfam in 2017, we found very quickly that this approach of delivering cash, more lightweight, easier to get to the islands, is significantly hindered by the nature, the limited nature of financial services infrastructure. Uh, why? Because traditional brick and mortar financial services were built for the mainland. It was not originating from the islands. It was not built for multi-island nations. Um, and what that means is that there's simply not enough bank branches and ATMs to serve such a complex and geographically distributed region. So now in the Unblock Cash project, we've managed to A, scale and expedite the delivery of humanitarian payments by building out a digital last mile to reach underserved communities and engaging those communities and the business people in those communities to help each other. So to help this system grow and expand organically and in a way that resonates with the way people typically transact with each other in, uh, in the island context. So this digital last mile reaches across that gap in financial services infrastructure, but it also builds on that infrastructure that we know we all already have. And that is really the infrastructure of community networks and connections. Um, as well as economies that are driven by small and informal businesses that usually cannot afford the types of point of sale devices that, for example, accept Visa or MasterCard. So geographically dispersed environments, totally decentralized geography also require a decentralized and lightweight solution. So to bring it back to where we are now, after the first phase pilot in 2019, that validated the approach and was successful. In 2020, Vanuatu had multiple disasters that happened all at once. So April 2020, we had a category five cyclone in the north of the country. Within 15 days, the country had fully shut down and closed its borders due to COVID-19, creating a major ripple impact uh, in terms of socioeconomic, uh, a socioeconomic crisis because of the reliance on tourism. And in the south of the country, we had a, an erupting volcano that was dumping ash on communities in the south, on the island of Tana. Um, in 2020, we also won the EU Horizon 2020 prize, which allows us to scale beyond the Pacific Islands. And we also managed to successfully pilot the project in the highlands of Papua New Guinea and also in Venezuela, which means that now this project operates in three countries covering three, five different types of crises across those environments. In Vanuatu, the project has gone to full scale 
So Unblocked Cash is now supporting over 20,000 people via a network of 350 local vendors, all the way down to what we call mamas in the market selling fruits and vegetables, thanks to that lightweight digital infrastructure and ease of use. Um, and you know we continue to respond and we've raised over $7 million for this project, both for Vanuatu, also to expand within the Pacific and under the EU Horizon Prize to expand to other contexts, particularly island contexts, where these kinds of lessons and this type of build from the island up is extremely relevant. Um, I know that Sharman had mentioned St. Vincent, so currently being used to respond to a volcano. And I do think that that programmatic model where the technology sits is critically important. Uh, it's so rare that our islands can give something back to the world. In the Pacific, I always joke that like our only export that people know about is Fiji water. <laughs> but, you know, I really hope that this solution and the way communities have been engaged in this community iterative product development can demonstrate that we can give back to others who struggle with the same challenges, whether it's the Caribbean or the Indian Ocean or the Philippines. Um, but basically in context where we we know the bricks and mortar infrastructure doesn't work for us or where we know that economic and monetary dysfunction has an equally severe impact on those communities. Uh, so I'll just wrap that up by saying that we continue to expand. I also work for a company called Emerging Impact, which has an MOU with Oxfam is, and is actively looking at projects to employ this approach in the Caribbean. Uh, and some of the challenges that we've faced have been primarily around regulatory challenges, but also critically digital literacy, financial literacy, and education integration. Um, and of course, changing systems, uh, which, you know, as we all know, some people are a bit resistant to. That's it for me. Thanks. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Sandra. Uh, George, you're up. All right. Uh, Talofa, everybody. Uh, Talofa is uh, hello in Tuvaluan. Um, really enjoyed that, Sandra. Um, so, yeah, today I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, Tuvalu, uh, the Tuvalu National Digital Ledger Project. Um, so, just a quick, uh, my name is George Siosi Samuels, I'm managing director of a company called FIA. Um, we're a community tech consultancy, so it's very fascinating to hear Sandra talk about the community component. Um, we essentially were created because of exactly what Sandra was talking about in terms of um, culture being a very important thing for um, the, the South Pacific Islanders as well, as well as many other island nations. Um, something that could really be given back to the world uh, through you know, more professional means or uh, through business, etc. So we help bridge uh, communities and technology, uh, specializing in emerging tech like blockchain. Uh, I was born on the island of Fiji, uh, so on the uh, Fiji water exports, um, Definitely kudos on that. Uh, to a Tuvaluan Samoan mother uh, and a Fijian Indian father. I've lived in Australia, Asia, uh, and now I'm actually tuning in from uh, Panama. My career history has spanned from startups to corporate, uh, worked in both financial and uh, tech sectors. Um, I was a developer, animator, uh, sales guy, marketing guy, and even community manager. Um, and I first got involved with Bitcoin in 2013. So if anybody here is actually um, you know, a, a Bitcoin OG, uh, feel free to give a shout out in the chat. Uh, I'm most passionate about community culture and blockchain tech. So Tuvalu itself uh, is located in, in the South Pacific, uh, halfway between uh, Hawaii and Australia, for those who aren't familiar. Uh, it has a population of around 12,000 uh, and is only 26 uh, square kilometers with just eight islands. Uh, the situation uh, in terms of how this project came to be, well, Tuvalu has spent the last decade lobbying uh, the world to help it in regards to rising ocean levels. Uh, unfortunately, things aren't moving fast enough, uh, so they're looking for their own solutions. And with debt politics being a very uh, real issue in the region, uh, how they find their solutions is as important as the solutions themselves. Uh, as part of these efforts, Tuvalu is undergoing a digital transformation process, uh, like many other island nations are right now, over the next decade, uh, which include things like improving its digital infrastructure um, and leveraging uh, specifically for Tuvalu, uh, something like its .tv ownership. So if you aren't familiar, Tuvalu had, uh, was very lucky in terms of being able to get the rights to .tv. So if you know uh, services like uh, 
Twitch um, and all these other streaming services that may leverage .TV, well, Tuvalu um, owns the rights to them. So every couple of years, they actually license this out. Um, and that equates to about 8% of its annual domestic revenue. So in 2019, I actually proposed uh, a five-point plan off of the news that I heard from uh, my relatives about the .TV renewal coming up in around 2022. Uh, and so the, the proposal actually leverages uh, off of this and uh, essentially in, includes blockchain technology as part of the digital transformation effort. Um, so if, you're, if anyone's actually interested, I'm just sharing the link in the Zoom chat. Um, you can actually see uh, the, uh, the, the proposal. Now, I think there was an original Medium article that you can check out. I'll try and uh, shoot that after. Um, so yeah, for, for blockchain itself, um, we've already had uh, two lovely guests uh, sharing about uh, what's happening in uh, their islands. Uh, but very simply, for those who you know, are still a bit confused around the concept, uh, blockchain is just a type of digital database. Um, it's often uh, a glorified uh, version of a database, um, but it is what most people are hearing about in terms of buzzwords and, and what people are familiar with. So for those of us who are uh, on the panel uh, today, we, we often use this as a way in to describe more about what black blockchain can do, but it isn't you know, a savior um, for everyone. And it's not the um, uh, end all uh, solution, but essentially it helps to record information in the form of data blocks um, that are chained after one another. Um, and it's usually very difficult to change hack or cheat, which is why the appeal from a data um, privacy and security standpoint. The earliest forms of blockchain were actually experimented with in the Pacific. So if you guys haven't heard this story before, um, there's a story of the Yapis people, and they actually use these large uh, round stone pieces uh, as, a, as a form of payment, but they ran into the very obvious issue of not being able to transport uh, this around. So they actually experimented with decentralization um, and blockchain consensus by actually getting um, people to the center of the village, announcing their transactions, and everybody in the village um, recording or memorizing this information. Now you can imagine when you scale the village up, this becomes uh, very difficult um, to, to manage, right? Especially for every transaction that takes place. And this was around 500 AD. Um, but why blockchain um, right now? So there are definitely a lot of solutions out right now, uh, but many are struggling with uh, what is known as scaling on chain. Um, as a result, the type of blockchain that we uh, chose uh, was made based off of uh, its scaling capabilities and um, actual patent support, which we believe will be something that will become really important over the next uh, two decades. So the project itself uh, stands for Tuvalu National Digital Ledger, so TNDL, um, and is an alliance between uh, my company FIA, uh, another blockchain company called Enchain, and Elas Digital. Uh, the scope was to improve uh, citizenship application process and develop a digital cash system. So this is different from some of the other projects that are happening in the islands, whereby uh, they might be just looking at the payment um, aspect itself, but we're actually looking at more of the underlying tech for data management, uh, et cetera. And if you look at, say, Bitcoin and how it leveraged uh, blockchain, uh, sorry, it's, its biggest feature um, or its killer feature was actually the micropayments aspect. And so we see a lot of new sort of markets coming out around the micropayments aspect uh, in the future. And so with this, with the digital cash system, uh, we're also, of course, looking at uh, potential CBDC options uh, in line with Tuvalu's digital transformation efforts. Um, as uh, Charmin also uh, mentioned, uh, Tuvalu is also looking at leapfrogging itself, um, you know, to going from things like having little to no online payment capabilities, a very real issue for Tuvaluans, um, to blockchain-based uh, payment solutions, and then having no digital citizenship application processes to one managed using a national uh, public ledger. Uh, through this, we'll also be able to set up the ledger to manage things like fishing rights, property and land rights, uh, police records, treasury accounts, and more. So that's why we actually call it the Tuvalu National Digital Ledger Project, as opposed to another uh, sort of uh, payments, um, just a sole payment solution. Uh, real life applications, I think Sandra actually did a great job of uh, sharing a lot of the real life applications. They're very relevant to Tuvalu. Uh, but in terms of what I'd add, um, of course, the online payment capabilities for with more transparency, but yet still keeping things private. Um, again, tracking things like births, deaths, and marriage records. A better supply chain management of uh, the fisheries industry. So uh, there was an article that went out recently about how Tuvalu and other um, island nations neighboring um, have actually innovated uh, for uh, things in the fisheries industry, um, mostly to do around how uh, ships actually now bid for time to go out and fish tuna. 
um, and this hadn't been done before. And, and so these are the types of innovations that's really great, but uh, to you know perhaps lower sort of uh, some of the corruption that is, is known in the uh, fisheries industries and, and other sort of mismanagement, this is where blockchain can actually uh, really help from a transparency standpoint. Um, and again, to echo on uh, the things that Sandra have said, has said, um, because of my own background in online community management and my Pacific heritage, um, I always did see that uh, a lot of the island nation cultures, um, you know, trust is a big thing. And really, uh, I was joking with the Tuvalu government uh, in one of our sessions that blockchain, essentially Tuvaluans um, have like a real life blockchain because they do things and they also might not do things because of the fear of um, sort of public rep reprimand or, you know, things that uh, people would talk, et cetera. So the culture itself is a form of management. Um, so this is, you know, really fascinating to see. Um, and finally, small nations have the advantage of being able to move quickly. So Tuvalu is finding innovative solutions uh, to its own problems rather than solely waiting for other nations to help. Uh, and for this, I commend the likes of Simon Kofe, who is the Minister uh, for Foreign Affairs, Justice and Communications, who I had the pleasure of connecting in with uh, when I first made my proposal, uh, and the Tuvalu government for taking the initiative to do something proactive. Um, and so it's our deepest honor to be involved in the project. Uh, we've just completed phase one, and uh, you know, there's a lot more uh, coming, uh, and we expect the project to be completed within the next uh, five years. And uh, with patience and persistence, then aloe fanatu, um, which is Tuvalu and for it will come. And so I look forward to learning more from the expert today. Um, if you'd like to connect, I'll put in my uh, social media details. And uh, thank for, thanks for having me. Awesome, George. Thanks for that. And I love the, the you know, the practical application, applica geez, applications you guys are, are bringing up right now. Uh, so last but not, but not least, Simon, the floor is yours. Just need someone to uh, let my video on if you want to see me. Um, here we are. Okay. Uh, so very grateful to be with you all today. And it was uh, wonderful to hear from the other panelists about all of the uh, impressive work that, uh, that all of you are up to. So I commend you for, uh, for your good work in the space. Um, so my name is Simon Chantry. Um, I'm a nuclear engineer by background. I got into the Bitcoin space through 2012, 2013 and co-founded bit.com. Uh, we actually started as a Bitcoin exchange. We were the first blockchain company in the Caribbean. Uh, and, and we started as a Bitcoin exchange and we've sort of morphed into a digital currency, a central bank digital currency technology firm uh, over the last sort of seven years. We uh, very passionate about the underlying technology and, um, and sort of all of the different use cases that, uh, that it can apply to. Um, I think based on what I've heard, you heard a great overview of um, BIT's sort of main project right now with the Eastern uh, Caribbean Central Bank. So Charmin did a, a wonderful job of uh, giving you an overview there. And we're super excited to be part of that. So I thought what I might do is try and just paint a, a picture of sort of how I see this space evolving from a macro perspective and some of the, uh, the forces at play and the considerations. And I'm going to try and touch on some of the questions that have come up in the, uh, in the Q and A. So, uh, and, and then feel free, I guess, in the, in the, in the Q and A after we can uh, discuss anything that I didn't touch on, but I, I thought it might be a good, um, I might be well placed to just sort of give a, a an, an overview. So, uh, Bitcoin was obviously the first um, digital currency that came out that leveraged blockchain technology amongst a number of other things, um, decentralized networks, append only uh, ledgers, proof of work, these sorts of things all came together to form the first decentralized permissionless uh, use case uh, uh, for, for, for blockchain technology and, uh, and created what's now known as, as cryptocurrencies. Um, so Bitcoin and then cryptocurrencies, and then now we're working with stable coins and CBDCs. And these all exhibit uh, qualities that I refer to as internet native payment rails. So when you think of uh, payments innovation that came out after the dot-com boom and with the likes of uh, PayPal and Zelle and Venmo and, and Stripe, um, all of these firms were internet native payment applications, but they were riding on legacy payment rails, as in they were still using the same plumbing, the same financial system plumbing that's been in use for uh, decades, if not in some cases, centuries. And, and so the, the financial system has truly evolved 
as you would expect it to, because humans have been conducting commerce now for thousands of years, it's evolved and it's had to adjust to the internet. Credit card networks are the same thing. They've had to adjust to the internet. Whereas Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and now stable coins and CBDCs are literally born out of the internet, right? So they actually properly leverage uh, internet technology, TCP IP, um, to transfer and store value. Now, Bitcoin is much more than just a internet native payment rail. And some of the questions that I see are coming up in the Q&A are like, what gives cryptocurrency value? And of course, that is a massive rabbit hole to go down in and of itself. And certainly a debate that happens regularly online. For those of you who are aware of crypto Twitter, I'm sure you can attest to that. Um, but let, let's just sum it up to say that Bitcoin basically has value because a massive and growing international community uh, believe that it is a store of value. It's got programmable scarcity. It's backed by a network of computers that's like hundreds of times more powerful than the most powerful supercomputer on the planet, right? So there's a number of different elements that, uh, uh, that, that contribute to Bitcoin's value proposition. And, uh, uh, and that's why we're seeing price surges. And, and so, I, yeah, I would encourage anyone who's interested in that is to look up you know, scarcity and look up st uh, store of value properties and, and so on. Um, but back to internet native payment rails, it's like, what do, what do they really offer? And I, I think I had said before that, um, you know, the, the, the payments companies that came out after the dot-com boom, uh, don't get me wrong, they improved uh, user experience to some degree, but there's still a good amount of fees embedded in their business models. And, uh, and, and you're basically not getting the settlement efficiency that you can get with an internet native payment rail. And so, well, let, let's talk about how maybe the legacy systems affect island nations specifically, uh, give, given the, the form that we're in. And then we can talk about how internet native payment rails might ease that burden or, or help uh, to reduce cost and efficiency. Um, legacy systems, as I'm sure uh, you're well aware, um, sort of impose, I, I think, uh, having lived in the, in the Caribbean for a number of years, um, impose sort of unfair uh, structures on uh, on island nations where the islands are dependent on foreign correspondent banks to settle either between islands or to set or settle international transactions. And that just leads to costly payments with uh, sort of high latency, like a, like a lot of um, time, you have to wait a lot of time and you have to pay a lot to move money internationally. Whereas you can send an email instantly uh, and it's it's just data that we're transferring at the end of the day. And so that's sort of a comparison that I like to make to say that internet native payment rails uh, are, are seeking to solve the issue of uh, um, that legacy systems have sort of um, not been able to solve yet for, uh, uh, for island nations specifically. And then add that to the fact that in a lot of cases, um, the financial institutions that are operational within islands are in some cases have their boards in other countries, uh, you know, North America and that. And so they may not have the best interest of the, uh, of the citizens um, at heart for every single decision that they make. So it's, it's another consideration. Um, and so when we, when we look towards what, uh, what either uh, cryptocurrencies or um, CBDCs and stable coins can do, again, as sort of the primary financial uh, transaction use case for blockchain technology. Uh, I, I do think it's about providing more low cost, uh, efficient instant settlement payment services um, to, uh, to island nations. Um, and there's a number of ways that that's accomplished. Obviously we're seeing central banks increasingly move to pilot their own digital versions of currency. And, uh, and you know, along with that comes reduced cost and instant settlement and, and a lot of great features that we're, uh, that we're looking for. Um, one of the uh, questions that did come up that I saw in the chat, which I find to be super interesting, and it's also worthwhile, uh, it's just worth a little bit of, uh, of digging in. Um, the notion that CBDCs are using blockchain technology, but central banks are centralized. And so are they really leveraging uh, the, the decentralization element? And of course, the answer is, is no. Central banks are not looking to build on decentralized networks yet. Now, if these decentralized networks scale effectively with security, then central banks may reassess that in the future. It may take five, 10, 20 years, who knows? These things play out over um, longer periods of time. But for now, central banks are keenly interested in using the distributed consensus function. And so what that means is these networks offer the ability 
for administrators to delegate different operators uh, with nodes that correspond to their institutional mandate. So not only can the central bank run multiple nodes and have their own distributed ledger that runs across multiple nodes, and that again translates down to where is the network actually being hosted on what servers, is it a cloud provider, is it a physical box on-prem? There's all sorts of different considerations about how to run these distributed networks. And uh, as you can imagine, central banks are keenly interested in making sure that there's it's always up, it's always operational 24-7, 365 that has good scalability and throughput. So it scales when it needs to, and it processes transactions very, very quickly. Uh, and so th these are all considerations that central banks are, uh, are implementing into the design of their CBDCs. And certainly uh, at BIT, we are, uh, we're working with central banks to develop these networks and deploy these networks. And so not decentralized, but distributed. And distributed is also a, a, a massive innovation, um, in, especially in the context of financial networks. And so I personally see CBDCs and, and stablecoin networks evolving to have uh, multiple node operators that are known, so they're not decentralized, they're known, and they, but they agree to the system rules and they all contribute to running uh, these networks and, and processing transactions. Now, again, a huge fan of decentralized networks as well. I think what uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum have done is, is incredibly impressive and it's an entirely different proposition because you, you do have um, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of, of uh, individuals and firms running nodes on a network and they're free to like join and leave at will. And, and uh, you know, the game theory that's incorporated there to, to make these decentralized networks uh, operate is, is really something special. Um, but it's a different, that's sort of a different ballpark that then, then we get into the realm of crypto and, and, uh, and sort of the mechanics of how um, crypto networks operate and, and sort of, um, you know, maintain not only maintain value, but also uh, provide the functionality that they advertise to, uh, to provide. Um, so I know that was a bit of a, a wandering. I, I did want to give an overview and, uh, and I hope I, uh, I did that well. So back to you, Stephen. Simon, thank you so much for that. That was, that was, that was excellent. I'm kind of glad you touched a bit on the, I guess the geopolitical aspect as well that, that many of our small island nations face. Um, but we'll just jump straight ahead to the Q&A. Uh, there were quite a few questions that, that were already answered um, by the panelists in the chat. So we'll go to some of the current ones. And this one, this one's very interesting. I'll, I'll leave it open to whoever, I guess, feels the strongest about it. But here's the first question from Priscilla, which is, what mechanisms, legislative framework, and others would be needed to ensure the treasure trove of data does not end up undermining marginalized communities? Example, tribal lands where ownership is common, but without formalization or tracking of at-risk members of society, for example, women in LGBTQ escaping violence. So this is, you know, about data structure, which, which is always an interesting question. I'll leave that open for whoever wants to start. Maybe I can give a non-technical reply, um, but one of the reasons, you know, with unblocked cash, you know, as I was building it was this kind of gut feeling that uh, civil society has a role to play in acting as a mediator in the way that blockchain platforms are deployed, you know, particularly in developing country contexts and in the islands, because what we've seen with business to business models or government to business models is that nobody is really giving the community a voice. Nobody is making sure that you know, GDPR, for example, standards are in place uh, as the minimum standard for delivery, but also nobody is really representing the rights of those communities and integrating a rights-based approach in the way that digital platforms are being rolled out and delivered. And so this is one of the reasons that, you know, we really believe through this project that NGOs, civil society, just like we play a role in politics and everything else, do have a role to play in protecting those rights, particularly because in the Pacific Islands in particular, but also other islands, there are very poor data privacy laws. You know, and at the end of the day, if the government is not looking out for us and them and communities um, and businesses are, you know, that may not be their top priority to protect data, they might be more interested in resharing data. 
um, that means that the only backstop that we have is, you know, popular representation and resistance. So that's my non-technical answer, but I'm sure, I mean, in our project, we use GDPR standards. Uh, that's an Oxfam wide standard, but I guess I'll leave it to the others to give the technical lowdown. Yeah, I might just add that um, from what I've learned over the years, and of course, by no means am I uh, an expert on the, the legal side, but uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of different jurisdictions. Um, and from what I've learned, you know, blockchain and, and maybe using the example of like Bitcoin, the implementation of blockchain, it's supposed to be like a truth machine. So uh, if it is implemented the way that was originally envisioned, uh, whereby governments and citizens also leverage you know, public ledgers, then this becomes uh, one big uh, accounting system, uh, whereby uh, anything that's already happening, if anything, it should just be made more transparent that could be used at, in courts as, as evidence, et cetera. Um, because I think we're still in the very early days, maybe uh, 10 years out of, of 30 that, that I kind of see for this to all really hit mainstream, um, I think governments are still trying to catch up uh, in terms of understanding the technology uh, to see that maybe in the end, existing laws already apply um, to a lot of these technologies. Um, again, though, uh, it, it really is dependent on the jurisdictions because, there, as we know, there's different laws um, in, in different countries. So uh, I would just echo what uh, Sandra said as well. Um, it, it's something that will need to be uh, looked at uh, with the local communities um, and, of course, always having them in mind. Excellent, thanks. Um, we can go to the next one. And and for the same for the same question, there is the the idea that you know it depends on the project itself, uh, who's behind it, that that these these particular issues may come up, and that's why it's important to have a, basically have an engagement with whoever is doing this work, because um, it's not a one size fit all. It's more of a and sorry, Simon, I don't know if you wanted to add to that. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to. I, I think um, and I think Sandra made a good point that like GDPR was a step in the right direction to protecting user data and really just drawing attention towards um, how, you know, how powerful the data economy has become and, and the consequences of not safeguarding data and just like the fact that, you know, I, I always come back to the point that like we're a, we're effectively this global species that's getting used to having an international network of communication and information. And we're like, we're, you know, we're literally just managing that now and, and understanding the consequences of our actions online and, and our data trails and whatnot. And I think it's, it's just something that's going to evolve. Um, but certainly regulation will, seems to be, seems to be helping. Um, I would say that uh, day one stuff is like never put personally identifying information on a chain. So that is not really meant to be uh, on, on a, you know, on a transaction network. Um, right now, what we're seeing obviously in the financial space is the AML compliance laws are, are sort of are, are applying there, which means that each of the service providers who build into these networks, they are the ones that have to collect the KYC information and store it in segregated databases. And so maybe it's shining a light on how important it is to safeguard those databases and keep them segregated so that they're only used for law enforcement and, and valid law enforcement. Uh, but of course, there's, uh, th there's many, many implications and the solutions, you know, some of them have been built. There's some great work been going on from the likes of, uh, shift and and sovereign some of these digital identity companies uh, that are working on solutions to, to this problem uh, but again this is I, I fully agree with george that like this is a uh, this is like a techno technological phenomena that's going to play out over the next like you know a couple decades or, or generations or I, I mean who knows how long and we are but we are establishing it now you know collectively and we will establish it by our standards. Like what are we willing to accept and what products do we pay for? What products do we not pay for and how we spend our money, right? There's all kinds of different uh, way ways that I think it'll evolve, but I just wanted to insert that, uh, Stephen. And Stephen, um, to something that you said earlier as well, it all, it all depends on who's doing it because in the case of central bank digital currencies, you know, the central bank relies heavily on moral suasion. And so they have to make sure that persons have the confidence in the product that they're offering or it will not be used. And so in our, in our case, even though we don't have um, data privacy laws that are prevalent, we do still um, have to respect persons' privacy and for them to have confidence that it's come from the central bank. 
because that is the only way we're gonna have persons have confidence using the Dcash. So we have to give the assurance that person's data will be, will be kept private. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so the next question has actually come up twice by two different people. Um, <laughs> So this will be interesting. The, the energy demand for cryptocurrencies and the infrastructure for data management is pretty significant. How can small island developing states ensure that climate and environmental footprint is not negatively impacted in the race to digital transformation? I'm not sure who wants to go ahead on that one. Simon, do you want to put, try your hand at this one? Uh, I'm, I can take it first if you like. I mean, yeah. I... Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so... <laughs> The, the energy usage comes from what's called proof of work uh, and, and proof of work is, is effectively like a, a way of, of verifying the integrity of the underlying ledger. And yes, it's, it's costly from an energy perspective, um, but it's also the first time in, in sort of human history that we've had provable immutability uh, amongst a decentralized group of, uh, of human beings specifically for value that cannot be coerced. It cannot be changed it can't be stolen right so this is a it's a it's a phenomena um that is it, people are clearly assigning value to it i think that's that's apparent with the influx of capital into bitcoin so there's people are assigning value to this so they find that function to be very valuable the fact that you can you don't need to trust any identifiable intermediary um, and you can store value on digitally on the internet so Let's just, let's just say, yes, humans, a large group of humans find this valuable. Now, what to do about the energy usage? I, I think what we're seeing right now from Bitcoin miners in terms of you, trying to use sustainable energy wherever possible, and that includes things like locating um, mining operations next to hydro dams uh, or using uh, uh, excess um, load from nuclear plants or using um, methane flare gas, or not just methane, but uh, um, natural gas uh, flares, where literally that energy would would go to waste um, if it wasn't used for for this purpose. Um, I see someone saying you're mining a valueless digital asset. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sure, I, I, a lot of people would disagree with you, but that's totally fine. You're entitled to that opinion. Um, the uh, Oh no, I lost my train of thought. Oh right, <laughs> the um, it, I think it's important to note that like if if you so I come from from like the energy sector. I did work at a nuclear plant for a few years before I got into crypto. And it's important to note that energy like power generation, um, the the majority of it gets wasted, and that's that's how our electric grid works. Um, you need base load all the time in order to have energy whenever we want it. So a ton of energy already gets wasted and base load is actually how you increase the overall efficiency. If you can increase the base load, you increase overall efficiency, which is kind of, it seems contradictory, but it's, uh, but it, it, that's actually the case. And so it's, I mean, it's a huge rabbit hole to go down uh, as far as when you get into mining and mining efficiency. But I would say those are a few points, you know, there's more miners looking towards sustainable energy. People have assigned value to this fact that, that they, you know, they want to have a, a decentralized store of value. And so humans are going to make it happen. Free markets are going to make it happen one way or another. But uh, George, you have uh, you have any input there? Yeah, um, I, I've, I've heard this question a lot and I always find it fascinating um, because if obviously there's a lot of uh, blockchain projects out and so it can seem very wasteful. But if we use uh, maybe a volcano as an analogy, right? At the beginning, when a volcano erupts, right? It's very wasteful, right? There's all this energy that's being forced out of the earth, right? And going everywhere, flying everywhere. And what's the value in this? But from uh, mother nature itself, right? These volcanoes are actually creating new land. And so I sort of see that happening in this blockchain space right now, where there are all of these new experiments uh, in, in blockchain and mining and whatnot that is just all over the place. Nothing's consolidated. But uh, going back to that sort of 10 year out of 30 uh, timeline, any significant human innovation um, usually takes around 30 years for it to like uh, make its way. Um, and so uh, with that, uh, the, the issue generally is not that it uses a lot of energy, but it's like, how is it using uh, the energy? Um, and, and I think this touches on what Simon was talking about. And there are a lot more um, initiatives uh, occurring whereby miners are looking to um, use a lot more uh, green sources um, trying to make things more efficient. And you also have to look at making sure that you're comparing the right things. 
um, blockchain as a solution was actually meant to uh, sort of overtake all of the other inefficient manual processes that currently take place, especially when it comes to centralized banking, et cetera, right? All the things that is required for um, maybe the manual movement of uh, physical cash, which Tuvalu um, still does, uh, but there are all these sort of inefficiencies that take place. Um, you could look at toilet paper, right? What is the point of toilet paper? You got water, many, you know, like, why don't we use water for um, our, our toilet usage, right? You think about it. A tree dies, is burnt, shipped halfway across the world to then be used for like three seconds, right? And then in the toilet. I mean, to me, that's a big waste as well. But these are the sort of the things that is often, um, you know, looked at or not compared uh, properly. So if we have in the, in the future, a sort of more mm, uh, single public ledger, just like we have a, a single um, internet, then the inefficient, the, the efficiency gains should overtake sort of all the other things that we're seeing now. And because of Moore's law, computers should get more efficient as well over time. Um, and the, yeah, as Simon said, we could get into a whole nother hour on this uh, topic alone, but that's sort of my, my general edition. It's really deep. Yeah, thanks, George. I just see another comment in here that, yeah, humans found tulips, fast food, pet rocks, valuable. You're totally yeah. right. Um, the, the, uh, the, the reality is if we want to get into all the value propositions of decentralized cryptocurrencies, we would be here for hours. So, I, I mean, I'm happy to like drop links in where these discussions are actually hashed out properly. And if you're willing to do the, the work and read up, um, then that would be cool. But uh, yeah, it's just, it takes a lot of time. Uh, I mean, I've been going, I've been in this space now for nine years. And I still have light bulb moments. I still have moments like, oh, it could do that too. Or, oh, wow, it could solve that use case as well. Or there's this implication or that implication. In fact, Sandra just clued me into one before this call where I was saying, I think that like a huge innovation in the space is decentralized consensus. And Sandra said, well, that's what culture is. I said, okay, that's fascinating. I mean, this is decentralized consensus for uh, keeping track of value, but decent, like culture truly is decentralized consensus. So, anyway. Yeah, no, those are <laughs> excellent points. And I guess I'll just quickly add um, to, to both Simon and George's points, actually, especially in terms of comparison, um, again, not to downplay the energy uses, usage of, let's say, Bitcoin or Ethereum or any proof of work protocol. But interestingly enough, the, the reason you're able to see how much energy or at least kind of estimate how much energy is being used by Bitcoin, for example, that's actually part of the system. The, the reason why that's that kind of stands out is because everything involved is so transparent. It's If you look at anything else, it's very difficult to actually see how much energy something is using. So for example, if you look at the energy usage of Christmas lights just in the United States for one day out of the year, it's astronomical. But of course, that would never come up in a conversation because it's much harder to actually look at and compare. So this, so just, just it's, it's an interesting conversation um, and it's something that, and, and how George said, uh, computers get more efficient over time. The, if you look at the very first computer that was ever built, it was extremely inefficient. It, it wasted a lot of energy. And if someone had said, okay, this is bad, let's stop there. That would have, we would not have allowed technology to play out. So it, there's, there's definitely an importance of definitely bringing up these issues and pushing for improvement, but also to make sure that it's at least going in the right direction. And that's where the, I think that's where the focus should be. But that, you know, that's just my spiel. <laughs> I'll go to the next question. Um, so can any of the panelists comment on current state of blockchain technology being used for the United States sustainable development goals within small island development states? Sure, I can jump into that. I mean, I guess the first thing that I put in is a caveat um, that the sustainable development goals by their nature being global goals, like every other global thing is very poorly adapted to the pace of development, the structure of economies, um, the structure of society in the islands. Right, so to hold small island development states to the same standard that uh, large mainland developed states are held in terms of reporting to those goals, I think is, is a bit skewed. And that's why we've either been disproportionately ahead or disproportionately behind. So a case in point is the fact that 
you know, Vanuatu, despite having very limited infrastructure, entire islands where people are still working based on a barter system, despite having 60% plus women having suffered from domestic or sexual violence, you know, has just graduated from least developed country um, status. Uh, but that's just because the government has managed to balance their books in a way that gets them across that line. However, um, I do think part of there needs to be an acknowledgement across small island developing states that we're going to need to put different tools in our toolbox if we're held to that global standard. And I think one of the tools in the toolbox that serve us particularly well are digital tools. So while other countries might be looking at more traditional ways to expand things like education um, for children, to expand things like improved access to food, improved food security, improved water quality, um, and increased income and a reduction in poverty using traditional means, right, like normal approaches to financial inclusion, uh, or through, you know, big social protection systems that larger governments are better able to handle, we might be looking at digital tools and digital solutions, uh, particularly when we can leverage kind of decentralized infrastructure that allows us to benefit from the equivalent of a global server <laughs> farm and a global database like blockchain without having to build that infrastructure on the island itself. Um, so I think it's hard to measure on the sustainable development goals because we're, we don't have the same measuring stick. We don't have the same units of measurement in the islands, but I do think that digital solutions, UNICEF is a really good example in terms of their engagement with blockchain technology to track schools um, and support innovation in small island development states and elsewhere can help us to fast track you know, our achievement to those goals. Um, but I don't think those goals, sustainable development goals or millennium development goals have actually ever been a good measure of development on the islands, period. And probably my boss wouldn't be happy about me saying that, but that's the truth, um, is that when you create global standards, some people get left behind and usually the smallest countries in this case get left behind. Excellent, Sergeant. Thank you for that. Uh, so the next question is, why is it that in most discussions today, one doesn't see participation from Indigenous peoples from Pacific Islands? Is there a chance to encourage engage engagements from Indigenous populace within the Pacific context so it is an interactive and inclusive platform rather than just listening to inventors or ideas or inventors thrashing out their ideas? A thought from an, an Indigenous Fijian woman. Sandra, I don't know if you want to touch on that too, or drug. <laughs> no, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, I'm originally from Rwanda and the USA. I'm kind of from all over the place, right? Um, but I can at least say that for the Unblocked Cash project, on the ground implementation, I am actually the only foreigner involved in building out and scaling this solution locally with the possible exception of, I think there's about a dozen grocery stores that act as vendors, but everybody else is Ni Vanuatu people who are feeding back to the service provider to update the platform on the way that it's used in a way that resonate, resonates with them. And we actually built it to kind of be customized for local communities in the Pacific Islands because we knew that we could not, sorry to say it, entrust you know, foreign companies to do that for them. Um, so I am the, mi the minority in my project. In Papua New Guinea, there are no foreigners implementing the pilot, um, not even any other islanders. It's a fully local team. And one of the magical pieces of that was that we had our local staff train their local staff and local vendors in Papua New Guinea over Zoom using uh, Vanuatu Bishlama, which is the pigeon spoken here, and Papua New Guinea pigeon, you know, so also demonstrating that when you have local leadership, local involvement, you can also enable cross island learning in a way that's more relevant to people. It's always going to be more relevant 
you know, despite however big my Afro gets, you know, for, for a Pacific Islander to listen to the testimony of another Pacific Islander, um, or for somebody from the Caribbean to be listening to the testimony of somebody else on another island. Um, so I fully support that. Uh, I think my number one job in this is really to be handing over this project to local leaders that are able to be at the next conference instead of you know, me talking. So I 100% agree with Ellie. Um, I'll let some others speak to this point too. Yeah, Bulavinaka. Um, so I, I think you bring up a very good point. Um, and it's actually one of the reasons why um, I felt it was important to be uh, very deeply involved in the project for the Tuvaluan side. Um, for me, I'm a, a mixed kid. So bo I was born in Suva. Um, so my dad's Fijian Indian. My mother is Tuvaluan Samoan, so that's where I have the Tuvaluan heritage. Um, luckily, my mom was very big on uh, teaching us the culture um, growing up. Uh, but one of the things is, you know, my ancestors, right, obviously left the islands to seek out better opportunities. And so part of this project was going, well, hey, my ancestors did this. Let me use the education that I've gotten, you know, as, as in, thanks to my, my parents and my grandparents to start bringing it back. So a lot of the issues and why you might not see indigenous representation is just, I think, one time and also access, you know, to the knowledge around these things, um, especially when it comes to blockchain, it goes off over the heads of many people, even in the space still. Um, and so part of our efforts is to, you know, be involved uh, and, and help teach and train people locally uh, to do similar things uh, so that we can hand off. But um, for me personally, I'm not just looking to hand off. This is something that I'm like dedicating my life to, um, at least for the Pacific region. You know, I want to be able to um, sort of guard against what we have seen. And I've heard this in the Pacific uh, sort of Facebook groups. People talk about blockchain imperialism or techno capitalism, right? They think that it's just another form of colonization happening again. And this is very real, right? You got into generational trauma, et cetera. Um, so I think it's very important for people who are cult culturally aware to guide um, technology companies, those from the West, et cetera, um, when dealing with implementation and rollouts uh, locally. Um, and I don't know if this applies to other island nations, I'm assuming it does, um, but I know in the South Pacific, these are very real concerns. Um, so yes, you know, let's definitely get more representation um, in the future. And that's why like I'm here, maybe Sandra, so that we do have more people of color too, you know, um, in these talks. Yeah, I might just like add a tiny thing because you mentioned this thing, George, on blockchain imperialism. Um, there was recently an article written by, I think, a French academic based out of New Zealand on blockchain imperialism in the Pacific. And I don't know if anybody on this call has read France Panon uh, and the white gaze, the notion of the white gaze, but I felt that extremely strongly when I read his article because this is somebody that I had met in person who knew exactly who I was and who chose to represent the white voices associated with the projects being implemented in the Pacific Islands and to not consult anybody on the Unblock Cash project. I was offended as an African woman coming from a country that has been colonized and has lived the consequences of war and genocide as a result. But I was also offended on behalf of a team, a beautiful local team that has made this work you know, not because of me, but because of them. Um, but, you know, I think it's incremental steps. The fact that we have a lot of people of color, we have mixed people, I'm of mixed heritage myself. That's complicated, we all know that, uh, you know, but that we have more people that understand and have an identity that resonates with the, like a legacy of your voice being taken away from you and somebody else like a white French academic preaching to you about imperialism, you know, people that understand the discomfort uh, that you feel like deep in your gut when you hear that. And people who, you know, like myself, I'm not a Pacific Islander. And I tell people all the time, like, I'm just coming from a place where I know if it was my country, I would not you know, I would want my communities to be involved. I would want my people to be given a voice. And I would want the solution to be built in my image, you know, as opposed to in the image of the man who thought that he could save us, which unfortunately happens a lot. So <laughs> anyways, just sharing where I'm coming from. Uh, thanks. The guy's exactly who I heard it from. <laughs> 
No, that's awesome. Uh, Sandra, I'm actually reading Wretched of the Earth right now and <laughs> Fernand did not mess around. <laughs> but um, th this, this is a pretty good one, actually. What are your thoughts about blockchain and crypto solving the de-risking issue with corresponding banks to island nations? I know all of them could probably jump on that. I'll jump in with a quick narrative, if you don't mind. I, I think um, there, there was a cool one when we first spun up Bit in Barbados. Um, we had we were offering at that time we were actually offering exchange of Bitcoin in Barbados dollars, and uh, uh, we, we no longer do that. But uh, um, what we found were there was there were three types of uh, clients who came, who came to us. They typically fit uh, one of these three sort of archetypes. And, and the first you can imagine was the technology enthusiasts. So technologists who had heard about Bitcoin, this was back in like 2013, 2014, or no, I guess we launched 2014. So it would have been 2014 or 2015 uh, and into 2016. So technologists who found out about the technology and were really interested in it and they wanted to get their hands on it and play around with it. Um, that was sort of the first type. The second was speculative investors. Uh, of, of course, wherever there's an emerging market, um, you're going to see speculative investors show up. The third was my favorite. It was merchants who had been uh, de-risked by a payment service provider. And they they basically coming to us saying, hey, I have a European client who uh, I can't accept payment for anymore, but they've offered to pay me in Bitcoin. You can cash me out into Barbados dollars, right? And uh, we said, yeah, of course. And so they were able to maintain their business continuity uh, by turning to an alternative payment rail. And I've heard many, many examples. Of, I mean, that's one of our examples from Barbados, but I've heard many, many examples of them. More recently, I believe in Nigeria, there's a lot of Nigerian businesses who've been turning to uh, transacting in, uh, in Bitcoin uh, because of this, because they haven't been able to, uh, to use payment rails um, for you know, one reason or another. So that's just one example that, uh, that I'm, I'm fond of. Yeah, for sure. And obviously, Simon, you know, we, we kind of go through the same thing in terms of some of our, you know, we call them family islands. So just the the less, the, less populated islands like Exuma, for example, where, uh, <laughs> and this is happening all over the Caribbean, but specifically in the less developed ones, sorry, not less developed, but less populated ones, the there's a complete uh, reversal or removal of banks that, where they're just pulling out. So people are just left with, um, they're, they're forced to use cash and then they may not have, you know, a, a, a plane coming in or a boat coming in more than once a day, maybe even once a week. So then any kind of trade or any kind of um, buying or selling or, or anything of the kind is very difficult. So it, it's definitely a problem that obviously um, central bank digital currencies, for example, or even just the use of Bitcoin is seeking to to uh or we could jump to the next one um okay so has anyone looked at using blockchain to validate and verify transactions in natural blue infrastructure resilience and sustainable development it seems it would be a very effective use for blockchain definitely anyone want to touch on that I know no one's specifically working on renewable energy, but. Uh, I can maybe touch on it a little bit. Um, the CEO at Emerging Impact, Robert Greenfield, has actually done some work on tokenizing and creating environmental commodities. So specifically around energy efficient infrastructure, how do you truly capture and be able to monetize the amount of energy that you've saved and use that to trade for other purposes, maybe to build additional, uh, building additional energy efficient components on new infrastructure. So that's a collaboration between Emerging Impact and a company called Block Power, which is based out of um, Brooklyn. I think. Uh, some other ideas that I've come across, uh, Oxfam Spain has a project in West Africa that we've kind of ideated on. I'm not going to say that it's being implemented. I don't think so. I think COVID has complicated it. But this is all around how it's possible to engage youth in farming 
particularly in rural areas. The same goes for fishing uh, in a lot of the islands where our youth are fleeing to the cities and there's a lot of traditional knowledge that's being lost. But there's a lot of, you know, coping strategies that are also being lost. So if we can engage, incentivize the engagement of youth in the harvesting um, and growing of natural resources as a climate change project. So in this case, this was planting trees and planting carbon sinks. So plants that act as carbon sinks uh, and putting those into a state, tokenizing those on the blockchain, pegging them to the value of a stable coin and effectively putting those into a a savings account for these youth that they could access after the age of 18. Um, and that could be accessed through tokenization and exchange against a cryptocurrency, which could then be off ramped into the youth's mobile money account in that country. So that's an example. I know also in Papua New Guinea, they have started to look at how to tokenize and monetize Papua New Guinea's rainforests that act mainly as a carbon sink for Southeast Asia and looking at how to get the government to certify that as an exportable natural resource. So those are some of the things that I've heard of. I think there are endless possibilities when we think about you know, large ocean states and blue oceans approaches across the Pacific Islands and the Caribbean. Uh, we are you know, really the, the stewards of these huge natural resources that have been under-recognized and the extent to which we can own, you know, does have a link with the extent to which we're able to tokenize um, the assets that lay within those oceans in a way that ensures that those assets are owned by islanders. Um, it hasn't really been explored yet, but I think it's one of the ways that we can start to grow our wealth in a way that accurately represents large ocean states and not small island developing states. So just a couple of ideas. Yep, I might just add to Sandra uh, on the, in terms of water, like water is already being traded as a commodity, um, and especially in places where fresh water, um, you know, is, is becoming scarce. Uh, and so what's really interesting is uh, there is the exploration of actually, um, especially island nations, um, being able to essentially um, liquefy hydrogen. Um, so the water and using, turning that into a, a sort of an export um, to some of these other uh, places around the world who are needing more uh, um, water. And uh, this then opens up sort of new markets as well in terms of uh, the ocean itself, whereby once upon a time, it was looked at as a threat for many island nations, especially low lying. They could actually then become its greatest as asset. And that's sort of what I envision happening um, in the future. Uh, so, you know, with everything we're talking about right now, uh, I guess it's about looking at things that we are looking at as threats or risks um, and then turning these into our biggest opportunities as well. Um, and it's always the case, right? With every sort of um, situation um, that you encounter, uh, it can be a threat or a risk to one person or an opportunity for another. Awesome, thank you. Um, what, is this, what is the market opportunity, if any, for cross-border settlement systems, uh, for example, Caribbean nation uh, banking systems or central banks? Also, what is the impact of their domestic distributed ledger technology in the settlement? Simon, that's all you. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. So uh, for a while now, like we at, at BIT have envisioned uh, what's called the Caribbean Settlement Network. And I, ha I have to give uh, some props to Gabriel Abed, um, my co-founder in, in BIT for his vision um, in sort of reigniting, I think it's called the Treaty of Chagaramas from the 70s, if I believe, maybe Charmin, you can call me out on that if I'm wrong, but I know that the, the Caribbean has had a, a multinational uh, settlement network envisioned for some time. Um, and, and it's mainly to, to sort of achieve uh, what I touched on uh, earlier, which is direct settlement uh, between island nations. And again, this technology can provide for that. It's, it's one of the main value propositions of, um, uh, of CBDCs is the fact that you can have sort of um, smart contracts that enable sort of atomic uh, settlement, atomic swap uh, or exchange contracts where um, 
like there's this instant exchange basically that can happen between two currencies. So right now, most of the islands uh, in the Caribbean, they have to go through the US dollar before they go like, so it goes like, you know, the initial uh, currency in the island, then it goes up to the US and then it goes to the target uh, uh, recipient um, for, for the conversion. And that's not efficient and it's, it's also not cheap. Uh, and so, you know, one of the goals that BIT has tried to accomplish and is on the mission to accomplish is to connect each of the digitized versions of the Caribbean currencies uh, with each other. But we're, this is not a unique goal. In fact, this is something that is, uh, uh, it's, it's touted, you know, internationally as one of the key value propositions of CBDCs. And so whether it be, you know, the ECB with the Euro uh, eventually doing, you know, a, a digital exchange and swap agreement with the Fed um, and with every other uh, country, big and small, this is the val this is one of the value propositions of sort of blockchain based uh, central bank digital currencies and so um, yeah definitely a, a huge a huge part of it uh, a lot of it does come down to um, the, the the contracts that the central banks uh, will have between each other because you can think like um, if it's going to be implemented at the protocol layer, the central banks need to approve these sorts of integrations. And so I, I think that because central banks are sort of of common mind that they want to decrease the cost of cross exchange and cross currency transactions, and they want to facilitate better remittance uh, services and processes that I think this will be sort of one of those standards that the central banks adhere to and are eager. It's a goal that they will be eager to achieve, especially for countries who have a lot of remittance inflows and rely on uh, remittance for, uh, you know, for a, a portion of their GDP, a good portion of their, their GDP. So it's, um, uh, yeah, I would say it's 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 part of the technology. It's definitely part of the value proposition uh, of of central bank digital currencies and, and stable coins. Awesome, thanks. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to touch on that. I did see another question. I can't find it now, but it was basically uh, asking about current legislation in the in the Caribbean related to blockchain. Um, if if everyone doesn't mind me answering that quickly, um, the Bahamas actually released its its Dare Act, um, which is focused on blockchain and crypto at the end of uh, in December of last year. Uh, Bermuda and Barbados have actually had their sandbox uh, blockchain infrastructure, I guess, or, or their regulations for a while now. Definitely a few years, right, Simon? Um, mm -hmm. So it, it, we, we definitely we definitely see it coming in the Caribbean. Um, Cayman has also been pushing for sure. Uh, and actually one of our goals uh, at the Caribbean Blockchain Alliance is to not only push for proper regulation and legislation, but for also to make sure that it's not only just a few uh, island nations, obviously every country kind of moves at its own pace, but it's, it makes us as a, as a region stronger uh, when we're all approaching and embracing this technology the same way. Uh, I think one of the things that would be amazing that we will definitely continue working on trying to do is to create like a, a regional regulatory framework where we're all kind of using at least a, a skeleton or a framework that other people, other countries can add upon or, or tweak as is necessary, but coming from the same standpoint or the same beginning point would, would go a long way. Maybe Stefan for the Pacific region, uh, I think, and I had put this in one of the answers, I don't know if it was to that question or another one, but you know, our biggest barrier, having a working project that can distribute payments to people in places where banks are not and allow them to purchase things unrestricted with flexibility across a network of local vendors and help island economies recover. Our biggest challenge is the fact that there is no regulation in place. Um, the Reserve Bank of Vanuatu has been very uh, risk averse. Uh, there's still a general assumption across many islands, not just Vanuatu, that blockchain equals Bitcoin, Bitcoin is bad, cannot be used for good, can only be used for evil, you know, and that is a major hindrance, you know, because the way we've been able to get this project across the corner is by asking for permission as a humanitarian organization and an NGO to use this technology responsibly, which of course allowed us to open a door that nobody else can. 
but it is also closing the door to sustainable adoption. Because at the end of the day, you know, I built this project so that it could just be owned and used by local organizations in the future so that it cannot, it can function with or without an Oxfam, you know, uh, with or without a database because it's based on this global, you know, borderless infrastructure. But at the end of the day, with governments on board to adopt legislation that enables that type of innovation and mass adoption by local people and companies and organizations, we just can't get there. You know, so it's very difficult. I think in the Pacific Islands, Fiji has been very forward. I know Tuvalu is working on something. The Republic of the Marshall Islands is also working on its own CBDC, but really being able to educate our governments on the, the positive economic impact this can have for our economies is still a major hurdle. And part of it is really a digital literacy and education hurdle. Because when we're leapfrogging, particularly in the Pacific where there are fewer digital payment solutions to you know, blockchain powered payment solutions and cryptocurrencies, there is a perception of risk and danger you know, by many old school style regulators. And until we can get that argument across the line, either by connecting islands or by getting our governments to you know, wake up and listen and not just want an NGO to do it, then our hands are tied. You know? So it's been my biggest frustration, honestly, in scaling this project. Yeah, I can imagine, and that's that's an incredible point because it just shows the 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 barriers and the kind of frustration that the entrepreneurs have to go through just to make things happen. Um, and of course, unfortunately, it's unavoidable. But we do have to continue to educate. And that's that's really the only way that uh, things happen. So that again, it, it becomes a much longer process, but. Hopefully we can, you know, continue to make things happen. Um, yeah, it, it's, but, but I love the point you brought up about, you know, continuing to connect your countries and continuing to connect, maybe say the Pacific Islands with the Caribbean, for example, where we're all kind of learning through each other, like we're doing right now, um, engaging with each other and understanding how, you know, each other is, is embracing uh, or at least approaching it. And that could potentially lead to, a bit more openness and a bit more speed in, ter in terms of making this stuff happen. So thank you for that. That was an excellent point. Uh, James, how are we doing for time, by the way? Uh, it would be great if you could wrap up, maybe kind of <laughs> from all the panelists. Yeah, and obviously um, for people who have continued questions, just hit all of us up, we're all on LinkedIn or you know, the various other social media, but this has been amazing. And I want to thank each and every one of you for, for giving, give, explaining what you're doing, but also answering questions and some of the, giving some of the best answers I've ever heard in this space. So thank you. Thank you all so much, James. Thank you for having us. Um, and that's all folks. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks everybody. Goodbye. Everyone, excellent Bye. job. Bye-bye.